here, but um, I'm the proud founder of the Trinidad City community. It's amazing to have our community here today with many of our members, and we're really happy to, to have you. We're a futures education and foresight, as well as community hybrid platforms for uh, foresight professionals and futuring creatives. And much of our focus is putting regenerative futures principles, uh, methods, and inquiry at the heart of our practice. And we also um, host Future Insights this year. So I know that in the room, there's a whole bunch of us that have a lot of experience and foresight. So I can't wait to explore this conversation with you. And I really hope that after this session, we all feel like perhaps we've rewired slightly our, our neural pathways or, you know, come, come out of this thinking of something differently or having learned something, hopefully that's the goal. And so just a reminder as well that the space we want to hold today is a safe space where, you know, different people are welcome. We're not here to judge and we're here to share authentically. This is obviously like kind of a loaded topic and, uh, and also a very interesting topic. So I'm going to just activate a poll in the chat for everyone. Um, just to get us like warmed up and then we'll, I'll be sharing the slides. Can everyone see the poll? Yeah. So it's just, you know, how often do you consider the ethics of, looks like it's cut off. Sorry about that. How often do you consider the ethics of future forecasting? So the first question is how many of us here work in the field of trend forecasting or use trend forecasting in their work? Um, so we have a few options for, the, for that response. I work in the field of trend forecasting. I don't regularly use trend forecasting in my work. Um, how often do you consider the ethics of future forecasting? Never, occasionally, all the time. Okay, so let's see the response to this. Everyone good? I'm going to close it out in a few seconds, if that's okay. Every, has everyone responded? Yeah, awesome. So I'm going to end the poll, and I'm going to share the results now. So it looks like 60% of us work in the field of trend forecasting today. 40% of us don't, don't but regularly use trend forecasting. And how often... Do you consider the ethics of future forecasting? 52% of us said all the time, wow. And 48% said occasionally. So obviously this is like a topic that I guess we're gonna have a lot to share about today. And so before I share my screen, I just have a suggestion, which is that, um, you know, just participate fully in this session if you can. You know, we wanna hear from all of you and make this interactive. And so just get comfortable, keep an open mind, feel a sense of positivity inside today. Hopefully, I know these are strange times. And, um, and also a few just zooms in, Zoom instructions that if you can, but you don't have to turn your camera on, use emojis, use reactions, uh, you know, put things in the chat. And um, as I said earlier, at the end, I'll have a special, special thing, um, special link to share with you. So. I'm going to uh, now share my screen. Let me see. One second. Oh. Having a little bit of a Okay, where is my Zoom? This is the part, for some reason, I still don't get right into this day with Zoom. So this takes me forever. So, um, so yeah, welcome to our session, the Future Lean Lab, the ethics of future forecasting. And so um, today our agenda is going to be kind of revolving around these four main focuses which is the uh, ethics from the perspective of the indi individual forecaster and their impact on the world. 
um, ethics from the collective perspective of future forecasters as a community, ethics from uh, the perspective also of the end user of what we do, to, and you know how might they, they be treating or expecting um, things from the future forecaster, and also a perspectives on whose future you know we're we're forecasting for, and so. I wanted to also just kind of um, share perhaps some learning out outcomes that we can think about and um, just understanding the moment we're in as a group and its effect on, on just how we, we do foresight and our purpose. There's a lot of questioning around what are trends for? Do trends even still have meetings? Where is future foresight going? And hopefully we can really improve our ability to dance between existentially conflicting perspectives and narratives and perhaps even some like cognitive dissonance and you know just a practical understanding of how ethics impact the very fiber of our work today and hopefully at the end of this session we'll also have um, some clarity and if you see this world building um, tree drawing that, that I created it's because world, world building is a framework that sits at the core of what we do at the Trend Atelier. And just before we jump in, I think it's important just to put some context in terms of why we're, future, we're hosting these futuring labs is that at Trend Atelier, all of our work is informed by the regenerative foresight framework called the world building framework. And it's really designed to support futuring creatives and foresight professionals. And it also informs kind of how we behave in, in our community, what we wanna learn, how we want to approach foresight. And we have four um, sustainable development goals as part of the UN's conscious fashion and lifestyle network, although we don't just focus on fashion. But so we have four main pillars in the world, in the world building framework, which are mission vision, methods, principles, inside out sustainability and expression influence. And they all kind of reflect four aspects of our work because in the community, and school hybrid that we have, we approach foresight also from the very specific perspective of the person carrying out the work of foresight. We, we do have future vision presentations that we host quarterly, but we also look at this from a very, very personal, personal uh, point of view. And, um, and today, I guess what we're going to be looking at is very much the aspect of inside out sustainability. Because what we look at in terms of our approach to sustainability is that it starts it needs to start from within, and that very often in our work, where obviously uh, many of us talk about sustainability in our work and really, really care about this, but we also sometimes fail to even treat ourselves sustainably. So there's some tension there. And so some of the trainings we have in the community is mindful productivity for our knowledge work, which can be incredibly taxing community also as a key part of futuring the ethics of future trend forecasting which informs part of this session we're also we're also going to have a module on creativity we talk about futures leadership and it's really also about centering our mission which is very much the mission vision pillar as well so just wanted to give you kind of quickly some um some context and um so so um, I think also I just want to quickly share, which is that from my experience, I came to realize that we needed to talk more about the ethics of future forecasting when I, when I was working for large agencies and just feeling like the same kind of reason that I had left fashion as a designer and design director were replicating in the foresight field where it was just pumping out a lot of report and sort of feeding into the over, over consumers and culture. And that's kind of like what started my journey. And so, um, you know, if you, I just have a quick prompt that, and I'm gonna just stop sharing my screen with you um, for a second, which is that, you know, what is it that you hope to learn today? If you wanna share in the chat, um, is there something specific that you, you, you know, you hope to learn from this session today? And if you don't know how to formulate that, that's fine. Um, you can just take two minutes if you want. Put the, this in the chat. Oh, read back the response. See, that's my prompt to myself to make sure I don't forget. So read back responses, especially for everyone who, who might watch the replay and not see all the chat.
Hi, Lillian. It's great to see everyone. I know for me, it's a constant learning process and it, it's more. It's kind of a, a constant learning process. And I, I and as I said, it's it's a process that's been from, you know, I think many of us discussed there's a lot of even increasingly a number of writing out there about this. Okay, great. Melvin shares, I'm curious to know more about I'm curious to know more about it um, since it's my subject. I would like to know future scope to consider it as a career. Uh, Mohammed says, I'm happy to find out how other professionals look at this approach and make it into their work with clients as I often wonder about approaching ethics, authenticity with clients in a way that makes sense and still makes sense in the capitalism future we're still in. Kiki Redhead says, other perspective on ethics, others perspective on ethics as the meaning can be different across regions, different companies, governments, and individuals, also perspectives from different industries as we are talking ethics and everything from AI to sustainability to healthcare, to product design and development. Orla says, the start of me reconfiguring how best to go about forecasting the future with newer AI systems becoming more prevalent all the time. Harry shares, I'd like to learn how I can transition from the mainstream current fashion industry. Much is spoken about change, but the mainstream Industry feels stuck. The process feels much the same as it always has been. Amazing. Thanks so much for sharing that. That really resonates. I think in terms of, uh, you know, I'm just going to share my screen again, but I think in terms of this session, probably we'll, we might talk more about it from the perspective of the, of the forecaster, not necessarily like future trends in the field of ethics, because that would be like a whole other session, but hopefully like we'll touch on some interesting points. And so um, ethics are principles that govern the ways in which we behave. And um, it's a system really of accepted beliefs that control behavior, um, especially such a, as a system based on morals. That's the Cambridge Dictionary definition. And so it's a system of moral principles that create cohesion in society. Um, about what, you know, where we define what is good for individuals and society. And also, it's also described as moral philosophy. And the term is derived from the Greek word ethos, which can mean custom, habit, character, or disposition. And so, um, you know, we ask ourselves questions today, like, can we justify living in such opulent ways when other people are really suffering? Um, is war or conflict or, you know, the AI, the AI arms race, is that ethical? You know, there's so many ways this can manifest. Is it wrong to clone a human being? Is it wrong to, to clone yourself as an avatar? What does that mean? mean um, you know, and what are our obligations, if any, for the generations of humans to come, but also in terms of us as forecasters, when we're, we're sharing all, all of these you know, when we're sharing insights and influencing others and the impact that, that that has today. So ethics deals with such questions really at all levels. And um, the terms ethics and morality are closely linked. And, and it's important to, to understand also and acknowledge that, you know, we're not going to go into coverage of religious conceptions of ethics or ethical systems associated with, with world religions, such as Buddhism or Confucianism and and also that you know obviously from where I'm based in the world and my own background personally and uh, perhaps some of you know our community not everyone obviously we're quite diverse this session may also sometimes come from a western perspective and we know we're not claiming to represent all perspectives but um you know when it comes to the ethics from the individual perspective which is our first section and their impact on the world you know, there are different approaches to ethics. And, um, and so there's the two sort of opposing, which are absolute, absolute, absolutism and relativism. And, and so absolutism is an unchanging and immutable set of moral rights or percepts, and it holds true in all situations common to all society. And relativism is more, you know, 
honoring a wide variety of ethical beliefs. And what is correct in any situation will depend on the con conditions at, at the time. Whereas a dogmatic approach takes the view that there's one truth, and that is a truth imposed for all situations. And a pragmatic approach will try to find the best route through a specific moral situation. And um, in that sense, it's a little bit similar to relativism. Whereas deontological is a non-consequentialist theory. And so here the motivation is incredibly important. And so an action can only be deemed right or wrong when the morals for taking that action are, are known. So for that, you need to show consistency, you need to show you know, principles such as human dignity, as well as universe, universality, whereas teolo a theological approach, and so these are like sort of the main different approaches to ethics, is a, um, this is also a consequentialist theory, whether a decision is right or wrong is, depends not on your morality, but depends on the consequences of and outcomes of that decision. And so that, that, that also has sort of um, uh, different perspectives that can influence that. Egoism sometimes thought as the thing of, you know, what is best for me? And, um, and also utilitarianism, what is best for the collective? What is best for the greater number? So that's like a quick, very quick intro. But in terms of our foresight work, one of the things we talk about in Trend Atelier is also, for example, ethics in our work as researchers, because there's different guidelines, for example, in scientific research that we can apply to foresight when we know that foresight is a soft science. So, for example, um, in sort of the main guidelines of ethical research, there's honesty, honest reporting of data, results, et cetera. Objectivity is a big part of forecasting, focusing on avoiding biases, caring and carefulness in terms of uh, not being negligence of, um, and uh, really, really carrying out critical examination of your work and making sure it's peer insured, having a lot of dialogue with peers. And, um, and also one of the key ethical aspects, which we overlook sometimes is keeping a good record of our research activities, which is part of showing, you know, its ethical um, credibility. Also in respect of intellectual property, respect of confidentiality, responsible publication. One aspect of um, ethical foresight is also mentoring. There's an educational aspect to what we do and social responsibility. And mentoring is a big part also of the ethics of scientific research. But there's additional things such as stepping away from extractivist logic, which is a term used by Naomi Klein. And, um, you know, definitely, I know that for myself coming from the fashion industry, we've made a rampant use of cultural reappropriation, copying of artists, profiting of Black and Indigenous cultures. And so um, writer, professor, and activist Naomi Klein uh, talks about an extractivist logic and coming out of that. And she talks about moving to a logic of care, which, uh, you know, which is another great way of framing it. But in our work, there's also some, something, you know, that we need to consider, which is ethical leadership, because we are leaders, you know, for us, uh, for, for those of us who, who practice foresight full time or who um, use foresight in our work, there's a sense that we are drive, a driving force potentially of change. And if not change, at least, you know, perhaps influencing others. We're maybe helping maintain the status quo, but we're, we're dictating to others what should be done. And, and, you know, even when it comes to foresight, not necessarily just for, for, for example, uh, consumer trends or behavioral shifts, or, you know, when we look at foresight, even just with design, if we're helping forecast design trends, design itself has physical, social, and moral consequences. So by informing designers, there's a ripple effect to what we do because then designers have so much power in the world. And so it's the same for us. We have, you know, we are one of the tools, one of the many tools that can help solve global, co 
global and complex challenges because people come to us also for risk mitigation, for really understanding what the future may hold. We, we often hear the term future proofing, risk management, you know, that's kind of part of what we do. So we have to, in this ethical leadership component, we have to see ourselves also as kind of mobilize, mobilizers. And that's quite different than what it used to be, where it was much more coming from a journalistic perspective. And so um, in terms of individualistic cultures, these are some of the criteria on the slide. I don't know if some of you want to take a screenshot. Um, and I think there's, there's some real benefits to individualistic culture, but there's also some downsides in terms of, um, you know, performatism or um, not thinking enough about the collective or, um, you know, always trying to appear stronger or self-reliant or, or putting a greater emphasis on standing out, it's kind of like brag culture. So those are some interesting ways of, of looking at it. But um, so I don't know how every, if this resonates with everyone, like please, please like post in the chat how you're feeling about this. Um, I just see Lourdes comment uh, that we forgot to, I th didn't see, like to learn about your philosophy. I finally have time to join the conversation. Oh, great. Thank you so much, Lourdes. Uh, that means a lot, always. And so, um, so yes, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, thank you, Lourdes. It was your kindness that, you know, um, but so ethics from the collective perspective of future forecasters acting as a community, obviously we're all t living together in the same land, sharing the same space. I mean, when astronauts talk about uh, their understanding of our world, you know, it's a great awakening when they see our planet Earth as one whole space. And although we all come from different countries, backgrounds, we're all all one. And so this makes us custodians of the land. And, you know, we can talk a little bit or also during this session, this part of the session about what is a collectivist culture, but just to honor also some of the wisdoms in indigenous communities. I think I came across this when I was doing some research and I thought it was really interesting to see how ethical knowledge in indigenous communities and ethical thinking begins at birth through a form of storytelling of stories. And I don't know if some of you have, have uh, read fables from, uh, I'm, I love fables from the, uh, the Native American people. And uh, I'm reading a book at the moment. And, and you really feel that through the folklore, that this is how ethics are passed. And I thought that was really interesting because we, last, last year, the year before, we talked about forecasters as myth makers and storytellers. And we're repeating this theme as a future vision later this year. We're researching into it. You know, where is myth making and, and storytelling going? We're definitely part of that story. I mean, in a cynical way, you know, marketing is part of myth making today. And we are very much a part of the marketing machine. But our core, you know, our connection with storytelling, we tell the story of the future. And, and that's a really, um, wonderful connection with an ancient practice that we should also celebrate. And um, a while ago, I wrote an article on my blog that this is nothing to do with Trinitaria called the forecaster as tomorrow's Grio. And a Grio is the name for a West African historian, storyteller, uh, singer, poet, or musician who communicates oral traditions and serves as a leader in their community. And sometimes they they work with royals or they, they advise royals. And I think as futurists, we, we kind of act as a conduit and, uh, you know, and we serve communities essentially. And in indigenous communities, the process of ethical thinking starts from birth because there's such a focus on storytelling. And I think part of an approach to ethical future forecasting is understanding that power of storytelling and researching deeper in, into that impact and what it means, means to us because storytelling is used to guide behavior and solidify belonging and responsible to a family, community, a larger world. And even if we might be forecasting a consumer trend, for example, there's still a story behind that. 
And so, uh, so I think, you know, some of the traits, we can also talk about some of the traits of collective cultures, which is that um, people are considered good if they're helpful to the community, generous, dependable, you know, attentive to the needs of others. Um, for example, you know, when you say I'm a member of a certain community or network, that's also a trait of a collectivist culture. Communication might be sometimes more indirect. I know, for like, for example, in the community in Trinidad, we're careful about how we communicate with each other. We communicate honestly, but also gently. Group loyalty might be encouraged. Um, and, you know, maybe some of the negative traits of a collectivist culture could be groupthink or not speaking up enough or but there could be some positives in terms of maintaining harmony and putting the the health of the of the of the group over your own personal um motivations and so those are some of the you know the traits of collectivist cultures and also obviously this is just a kind of generalization because again if you looked at indigenous cultures might be like very very different and um but i think it's important in terms of collectivist culture and the in the perspective of ethical foresight to also think about conformity and um so this is a quote from careful industries that were founded it's a research consultancy founded in 2019 by rachel Koldica. And they talk on their website, you can explore, there's a page called Building Relational Foresight. And re a relational practice, it's actually a term coming from a social care originally and healthcare. And it's actually a term that I first heard from Sital Salanki, for those of you who might know her, her uh, she runs a consultancy called Matter. She's a materials expert. And so, um, careful Industries talks about building relational foresight, and and in, they've created a report where they've examined how established foresight practices relate to traditional power dynamics. And um, I, I haven't quite come across a report quite like that. And and it, their analysis also um, helped them identify behaviors needed in relational foresight. But essentially, relational foresight is oriented uh, towards justice, not just test technical possibility. And um, it's about embracing distributed pot potential, rejecting reductionism. And um, some of, you know, I'm just reading out loud, but relational practice is a way of working or establishing and maintaining a helpful interpersonal relationship is the priority. I couldn't find, like, when I first initially researched that term a couple of years ago, I didn't find a ton of of information, but it seems to be gaining traction, this kind of relational work. But I think what's important in this quote on the on the slide is that, and I think this is something that Devin Powers kind of touched on a couple of years ago in her piece that went viral on Medium, and then she was interviewed by the Futures Laboratory, where she she talked about the fact that many foresight agencies, and I think as individuals, we we fall privy to that. We, we, we fall under conformity because we feel to fit in, we need to tell the client or the audience what we think they need to know. And that's a really tricky space that we inhabit because we need the work. We need, you know, there are certain things that happen there, but the issue is that um, we might be fe feeding just particular interests. And I think this is where things have gotten murky with the ethics of forecasting is that I think we've lost ourselves sometimes along the way because we've had to, to please a corporate and capitalist world, very based on consumption, sound bites. And we felt that if we didn't do that, we, you know, we would fall by the wayside. So, um, you know, and Matt Klein kind of touches on that. Um, in especially, I feel like that tone has really escalated in his really recent newsletter. If you follow his zine newsletter, it's excellent. He's also been stepping up this. Um, 
audience capture, which is actually more of a, almost like an art piece. There's some really great items in there. And, you know, he thinks that we're very much um, falling under the, the, the rule of the algorithms. Um, and I think, and he's obviously the head of trends at Reddit, but I think that as forecasters, we've very much also fallen into the slot of audience capture, the attention economy, and traditionally, I know that when working at WGSN, our titles were editor, et cetera, we fall under that kind of press news kind of agency. And, um, you know, everyone is, is sick of cottage core and Barbie core. And so there's this idea that in a moment, he says, when in a moment when trends are trending, we need to slow down and remember the human. And it's a real reckoning because there's, What's great with Matt Klein is that he's representing what so many of us think or have written about. There's a lot of, there's quite, if you look for it, there's actually quite a lot of articles about the, the, the questionable nature sometimes of trend forecasting, especially when it comes to fashion. But what's great with Matt Klein is that he has such a huge audience and having just won the Independent Webby Award that it's really popularizing this idea. And I think it's, it's making this conversation even more urgent. So um, I just wanted to share briefly that I, I had this questioning with Fashion Act Now, whom I, I'm a founding member of, a couple back in 2020, I wrote Why Trends Are Your Friend. And we wanted to make that title a bit spiky because in the sustainable fashion parlay, there was a lot of words like, the trend is not your friend was actually you know, a placard at a Extinction Rebellion protest or what's trend today is, trend, is trash tomorrow or are trends over? Those were all um, links to articles by Clara Press, Wardrobe Crisis, you know, Fashion Revolution. And so you could really feel that that connotation of the word, which again, we talked about language earlier, and how language frames who we are. The word trend is really getting a bad rap and I feel like we need to reclaim its good reputation. And I think part of that is also a reckoning with perhaps a, you know, a more ethical approach of what we do. But I do think that we, you know, especially with fashion trend forecasting, we've been complicit in a system of um, our obsession with the new. And so this is a piece I wrote, it's on Medium. I invite you to, to, to read it if you wanna explore some of the things, there's a lot of links in there. Um, but, you know, at a time where we're all questioning our purpose, you know, it makes sense that we're doing this as well. I'm just looking through some of the key points of this. Um, you know, I think speaking for fashion specifically, you know, our, our obsession with trends fueled an incessant delivery of new collections. And that's kind of what's also given it a bad rap. And we've seen that replicate in in the social media world with TikToks, et cetera. And so, but trends are profoundly much more than their current subversions. And they're, they're really a reflection of human needs to create myths as a way to keep our societies cohesive. And you have Yuval Nohari, Noah Harari explains in Sapiens that trends reflect cycles in time and personality types. And he, you know, he, he, he talks about it even in terms of myths and how we need that to create cohesion in societies. And even with the diffusion of innovation theory, even though that model may sometimes feel outdated, it kind of shows a, a reflection of cycles and time. And so, but I just want to like quickly invite Nayara, who's with us today, because uh, Nayara is a forecaster and a uh, UI UX designer, and she posted a few days in the community about this um, article. I, I'll let you uh, take over, Nayara, if you want, and I'll stop sharing. I just saw it all over, like LinkedIn, and also got in the newsletter. And uh, I mean, we have this. Discussed... Do, do you mind just referencing the the title of the of the piece, so in case some people may not know it? Oh. Let me open I can, it. I can find it. You know what? It's fine. As you speak, I'll find it. And I'll yeah, I it. think it was. Don't worry about it. You 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 keep speaking and I'll find it. I have it right here. Yeah. So we we have been discussing this for years, like since the community started. And uh, it got my eye because the, the 
title was so triggering, you know, and immediately I got so anxious and I needed to share and get perspective from people. And then in also like right after I posted, Alina also joined and commented. And I mean, it's just like you said, we talk so much about movements and trends and this has been a long history. And right now it's just like happens every day. There's a new trend every day. There are new clothes or whatever way of living style. And people just don't know, do not process it in a like long way anymore. They don't care about the meaning and what, where that comes from. It's just used in a such a markety way just to get more clicks and views and sell more stuff. And, and our works, which is like super funded in research and like really exploring and thinking strategically is just like go through the drain like oh spend some a few hours on tiktok and therefore you think you can wrap up everything and what's happening in the world you know that those are my views it's funny because just as you shared this um i had a client that um without going into detail, but they wanted me to do some trend foresight work around um, some trends that they wanted to put out as part of their sort of PR and showing how like what they're doing fits into certain trend that was um, really getting traction. But the trend was getting traction so fast and it just died off just as fast. And I've had two projects like this in a row where I do all this stuff that's kind of meant to go in press or PR and and it for them and and it just doesn't go through because like the press has already moved on. So it's it's been really interesting. I've never seen that happen before. It's just such a quick cycle. And I mean it also makes us think, especially those agencies, how are they gonna use the work of forecasters in the future or if they even gonna still collaborate with people who are thinking deeply over those subjects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I also uh, was thinking in terms of, um, sorry, I, I'm just, uh, do, did you have anything else you wanted to share, Nayara or, or Alina? I don't know if like you were, a couple of people here were part of the conversation. Well, one of the, one of the points we discussed um, or an opinion that I <clears throat> that I phrased was that I that I think it's really sad for for me as someone also working in the in the in the trend forecasting industry um, how the word trend is used and in my opinion often wrong wrongly used um, because I still think that trends are essentially a large tendency uh, and I it. I find it tragic how how the word is often used for what is essentially a fad or a look or a an aesthetic. So I work in 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 trend forecasting for the design industries, and a lot of times I think, well, this is not a trend. It's just it's just a part of a, a sub part of a look that's been around for years, but that has been shifting. So I still think that we have tendencies uh, in how things are, and it's just it's just not the right term that's used, but I don't see it used wrongly by people who actually work in the trend forecasting industry. It's mostly it's mostly um, social media managers or or people from from um, you know like magazines and journalism that are picking up this term trend and use applied in a different way. And then there's this other part of me that thinks, well essentially language has also changed always not just for the word trend words have changed the meaning completely no matter where we look whether it's where whether it's slang words um, that all of a sudden change the meaning to become something mainstream or the other way around and is it time to let go of the word trend so we see in the trend forecasting community so many people changing their their titles now so many trend forecasters are now strategists or consultants and and so on and this is something I have not come to a conclusion yet. What I'm certain about, though, is that the amount of times trends is used currently, I heavily disagree with it. And um, I wonder if it's just semantics, but ultimately, I think how it's going, it has influenced how people are viewing the term. And part of me hopes we can reclaim its original meaning and be a bit more considerate about it, because this has happened with other terms as well. And it was possible to actually look into it deeper. 
Montaha had an interesting point also in terms of uh, semantics, like uh, people don't seem to understand the difference between uh, that people don't seem to understand that a forecast is a vision of the future direction and trend is what is now established in the market. And I was actually just reading that on the, even the difference between foresight and forecasting. Foresight is not trying to establish a certain uh, outcome, whereas forecasting is more data-based and trying to establish a, a, you know, a more certain outcome, which is, it, you know, something we're just, unless you've really studied foresight, you're not always taught that. And it's, I think part of this is also perhaps, yeah, we don't have enough of an established sort of curriculum or, or cohesive way of, of using the language. And, and I think that clickbaity thing is something that also, you know, we've sometimes fed in, but on a positive note, if I just may move on, cause I, I just conscious of time, but there's so many amazing projects out there in the field of futures. And I think we have to remember this. And the fact that Matt, someone like Matt Klein is getting so much attention right now makes me really hopeful. And uh, there, there is a sort of a groundswell of using more speculative design and things like that. So I'm hoping things will change, but like, I just, I, I will share in the newsletter. So for those of you who haven't joined if you know what I do after this is I usually share a bunch of links but I just wanted to list like a couple of books like um I love the future now project or I don't know if some of you have learned of heard of get lost labs which is um by Julian Ellerby who's a former uh, um future lab I think forecaster he works primarily in with and for nature and takes forecasters or agencies out in nature. There's just so many interesting projects out there. Like I love this piece called Unsettling the Coloniality of Foresight by Arati Krishnan, or there's a book called Defuturing a New Design Philosophy by Tony Fry, Changing Matter by PCH Innovation. There's also a podcast with Monica Belkiet, who also is actually someone who created Protopia Futures, which is a kind of, of, of framework to push back on restrictive narratives. But she has an interesting podcast interview called The Evolving Leader, The New Wave of Futurists. Some Foresight to Action by the IFTFF, which was shared by William Marino in our community. There's a bunch of things that exist in our community uh, portal, but obviously uh, just wanted to share here a circular it's a really interesting report uh, called Inclusive Innovation Report by Robin Klinger Vidra, Alex Glani, uh, Courtney Savvy Lawrence. There are people from Nesta, uh, but also the Circular Design Lab in Bangkok, Thailand. Um, you know, we had a session on how to do and think uh, regenerative forecasting. Or if you check out our YouTube, we have a session called What is Purpose Let Forecasting? But Walker Art Center is a really interesting place also to read some interesting articles about the future. They have a piece called Defuturing the Image of the Future, which is super interesting and actually requires multiple reads because it's quite dense. And Earth, the Earth Logic Fashion Action Research Plan is amazing. Yvonne in our community, Yvonne Richardson, shared a really cool one, which is called the Inner Development Goals, sort of mimicking the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, which is also for pr creative practitioners. Obviously, I, I mentioned careful industries or the RSA has the design for life framework. Uh, there's the department of dreams. Cassie Robinson also wrote an amazing piece called change happens if our collective imagination happen changes. I mean, every day we come across a, a new piece. It's, it's just amazing what's happening um, in other projects you know, a festival called Other Futures or another one called Attending to Futures. There's a really interesting organization here in London called the Future Absor Observatory Forum for the Future, UNESCO Futures Literacy. I mean, the list goes on like this is, there's just so many amazing projects. So I think, um, yeah, not to, you know, just to try and like show that there's there's some really amazing things also happening. But um, I'm just gonna go back and share because in term, I just wanted to quickly, and this is going to be thorny, and we're sort of reaching the end of our session. 
but perhaps we can just have a very honest conversation as well, like in terms of how people also treat us. You know, like we want to put out ethical work, but I think we also have to establish ba ethical boundaries of how of expectations from us. And I think I wrote about this as well, like unethical pricing practices in our industry, which are further cemented by the fact that if we want to break in, we have to price ourselves so low, which as someone who worked for a long time in the US, I just did not see happen. I think this is also a bit regional sometimes. Um, I don't know how some of you feel perhaps uh, having worked in the US, but as far as when I worked in the US in design, but also across fields, I see it. Um, unethical time expectations and workload evaluation. It's crazy how much we burn out, uh, how many of us burn out. And also sometimes extractive ways of treating us because we're seen as patrons or part of the PR machine. So people contact us so that we talk about their projects. And sometimes that's really cool because you feel like, wow, this is awesome. I'm meeting amazing people. And it, that is true. But another side of that can be where they only see you as a supply source. And so there's a way of establishing a mutually beneficial relationship. And I think that, um, you know, in terms of even moving back to our pricing practices, as you can see here today, many of us are women. And, you know, as far as I can see, we're not always that good at asking for what we're worth. And so I think, you know, this is really a tricky domain because we all need to make a living, but I think we really need to also start sometimes pushing back at the way people um, see our work as secondary sometimes. Yet we are, we are central to the levers of making decisions. Absolutely. Like, even if a team may not use an independent forecaster or a trend agency, they will be doing future foresight uh, in, in their work. So uh, in order to, to, you know, look for what's next. So just also quickly uh, finish in terms of, this is a quote from Nemesis, I think most recent report, although it was published months ago, called in the, and this, this, um, it's just to touch on our intimate relationship with the creator economy and the attention economy and falling into the traps of audience capture, which is something sort of touched on in, Ma in Max Payne, where they talk about um, you know, endlessly remixing for novelty for both the experience economy and the attention economy. Yet even when things got extremely random and nonsensical, an illusion of meaning is mostly retained. And they talk a lot about um, clowning and it just, it's a really interesting report, but um, in that report, uh, the nemesis team also said the least likely outcome becoming the most likely made people think that counter training their intuition was a winning tactic leading to behavior that was high risk, low conviction. And I just wanted to point that that quote in terms of having conviction in your work, but feeling sometimes like you need to get into that attention economy hamster wheel. And so you, you sort of like negate your intuition about things like how something might not feel right or might not feel native to your beliefs or, or where you see the future because somehow you feel you need to, to fit in the status quo. And I highly recommend that you read a piece uh, that you can download, but you can also pay for it called After the Creator Economy by an organization called Meta Label, which I, I, I've spoken a few times about in the community because I just love what they've done. And, and it's actually uh, founded by the Nancy Stryker, who's the, one of the co-founders of Kickstarter. It's a really wonderful report on um, various creators talking about where they, online creators, influencers talking about where they're landing. And so um, just really quickly, ethics from the perspective of, whose future also are we forecasting for? Um, there's a piece that I might share because we're running out of time, but it's a wonderful piece called on the Native American Code of Ethics. And I'll just share it in the chat here because I'm conscious of time. But um, and this code has survived thousands of years, far, far longer than, for example, how long Judaism has existed or Buddhism. Um, 
the Native American code of ethics, according to the writer of this deep, goes back 11,000 years. And um, search for yourself, by yourself. Do not allow others to make your path for you. Do not take what is not yours, whether from a person, a community, the wilderness, or from a culture. Honor other people's thoughts. I'm just going through. Never speak of others in a bad way. Um, yeah, just, just a really nice, interesting piece. And also just reminding ourselves that part of an ethical foresight practice is putting imagination in the driver's seat. That's very much something that comes from experiential futures and um, design fiction and, and fields such as uh, experiential, uh, sorry, speculative design. But um, there's a quote here um, in, that, in, in another piece by the Walker Art Center called The More Equitable Future. Be no, sorry, The More Equitable Futures Begin with Imagination. By, Marani, by Marina Corby, I'll just share the title in the chat. And in it, she quotes uh, Lewis Hyde, professor and author of the book, The Gift. And uh, he says, the imagination creates the future. And so, yeah, it's all about needing to think and feel conditions that we haven't lived through to challenge ourselves to think uh, of our work ethically because, um, by creating a more imaginative and experiential approach to the future, we experience the future as if it was here rather than colonizing it with just random ideas. So, you know, I'll just say it very bluntly that for us at the Trend Atelier, I think many of us, all we personally care about is the planet and the restoration of our systems. That's fundamentally all we care about. And, uh, Fred L. Polak in a book called The Image of the Future called, says images of the future are images of the totally other and they are revolutionary and radical in nature or they are nothing at all. And he says all acts of design are themselves small acts of future, ma future making. And, and so that, you know, in a sense, we're working for the planet. So that's part of, for us, very much our ethical North Star. And I just want to leave you today with just thinking about being in inconvenient. Like, I think about um, who are you forecasting for? Businesses or the well-being of societies, communities, and the planet's ecosystem? And if we're focusing more on our planet and our people and our, our creatures, is that inconvenient? Why is that inconvenient? And if it is, then, you know, I don't think it's inconvenient because actually we don't have a choice. And um, so, you know, we propel products and services and I think there's space for us to be inconvenient and not follow the status quo. And that's kind of partially what Ethical Futures is about. Um, yeah, but, you know, saying that I'm just as embroiled as everyone else personally, like we're all, <laughs> Uh, you know, unpacking this. And um, so I just wanted to, to yeah, end this, this uh, slide deck and just say quickly, thank you. And I'm going to share a link with you um, before we go. But basically, um, we're creating this kind of personalized training. It's a questionnaire. And it's, it's in the works. It should be done in the next month or two. And if you want to to join the sort of the waiting list, it's a, um, it's for your very own futuring journey. Futuring journeys are um, guides that we have in the community and making special ones for people who maybe just want free access. And uh, so here's the link. It will also sign you up for for our newsletter, just FYI. But you you can unsubscribe at any time. And also, if, but if you're part of our newsletter, we won't spam you, but you know, also you'll know all the things and all of the links to these presentation I exclusively share in the newsletter. Um, so, cause I, I write, I do write the newsletter, although we are talking about newsletter takeovers with, with uh, community members. So um, just wanna make sure like you miss anything. Anna mentioned things. There's so much I'd like to say about this topic. So many questions. I don't know, Anna, if you want to connect with anyone on, that's been on the call here. 
um, you know, and continue further connect with, with us. Um, I'll, I'll share the email. It's hello uh, at the trend activity. And we'll post the replay of this in on YouTube as well. But I'm happy to stay a few more minutes if if for anyone who wants to to stay like five more minutes and and just keep chatting. Anyone would like to to chime in or say something? Um, you know what what this has brought up, or so even if it's a sensation, I did have an exercise, but we didn't have time to do it, which was like. The prompt was, it was an activity about consciousness and what consciousness means to you and shared actualization because shared actualization is a term I heard from author Simon Sinek. And I thought it was interesting because, um, you know, as we talk about AI and consciousness, Todd Lipson says that the fundamental difference among types of consciousness, human consciousness and octopus consciousness, consciousness and rag consciousness is how far into the future an entity is able to imagine itself. So I thought that was a nice touch, but um, yeah, bye, bye, Alina. Everyone has to leave, but I don't know, like, um, yeah, what this endures for you in terms of the conversation, how, how you feel about it. I mean, it's interesting, different perspectives. It definitely gets a lot to think of it. Makes me think a lot of different stuff and it's hard to like to share. But I was thinking a lot about what Alina said. Maybe the word, the words trends just is exvasiated their meaning and it's a time for us to either fight back and start communicating what we work with and how we work with sharing more about processes and methodologies and why we are so you know focused on that and also or you know just let or change our naming like she suggested like i now am calling myself like cultural strategist with focus in technology because when I just talk about trend forecasting, majority of people don't know what it means, especially in the Scandinavian market. In Brazil, it's much bigger. Like if I say that, I know that I get a foot in the door in any place. But here it's like, ah, what is this? What do you do? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I feel tough about or also the part of, we had this discussion before, Jordan, like futuristic, future, futures researcher, future ring design and stuff like that. There's also a lot of conflict in this wording sometimes. Montaha calls herself a color ar archaeologist. That's nice. That's great. Color archaeologist. Um, Alina is a color expert. Mohammed, you have something to say? Hi. Um, I think, especially in regards to the naming and whatnot, so from the output of the industry, I think it's it's really our responsibility, especially with the increasing and evolution. It's our responsibility to redefine our roles, because maybe in the past mm -hmm. we did work as only trend forecasters within certain, you know, limitations, which is like okay. Producer report, do this, do this, do that. But as the world has evolved, as you know, access to technology, information, transparency, this, 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 and that has actually changed consumer behavior, which is the trend. <laughs> Our work has also evolved. Some of us has conti have continued to do that, and some of us have maybe morphed their practices into something else, utilizing trend forecasting and foresight and futurism methods. And I think we really have to become way more intentional about our use of words because that will take time. And it doesn't mean something is good or bad. It just means that we just have to use our voice, I think, to where we feel is important. And also sometimes not share, you know, if it doesn't matter at all. I think, but other than that, I have wholeheartedly enjoyed every moment of that presentation because 
in a way it made me feel not alone considering these things and, and having these feelings of no i need to have i'm responsible because if we advise companies we are responsible for what happens in the market we cannot sit after two three years and five years and say oh the world's getting worse <laughs> you know <laughs> like if we had you know if we had a hand in that i think we have to also be responsible thank you and that Devin Powers talked about uh, how agencies were just blind, just telling what people want to hear. And I think it's okay to be spiky, not in a way to gain attention, but just to be to be honest about the trends. And I recently, um, I was asked last week to be interviewed about Barbie core and hot pink. And I said, no, absolutely not. Like, I told her, I was like, I don't, you know, this trend, it's like, don't give it more attention than it needs to. But the, the, it's, I, I think lately I've been using the word futuring, which is a term like user floating around. And um, I like the idea of an action or an inquiry of like a movement or, but then even the word future, I feel is being co-opted. So it's like, it's like, it's a free for all. But um, obviously, the topic of ethics is so complex, just, just to say, because I know everyone wants to leave, but it's, it's such a complex topic. In one hour, we barely scratched the surface. So I hope that in upcoming sessions that you might want to join, we can continue to unpack different uh, aspects. The next Futuring Lab will be on public speaking. Uh, because for some of us foresight, foresight practitioners or even people in design, we have to present. And I think it's a nice opportunity for us to actually make an impact. Some of us might not want to have that role or present, um, and therefore public speaking not, might not be required. But sometimes you might be a bit shy, but in, invited to a panel like what are the tools that you can acquire to speak your mind in, in a way that you feel natural and, and eloquent and you know inspire others? Because I think we really have this power to inspire people and, and we shouldn't underestimate that. So that's what the next Futuring Lab is, is gonna be about, just, just FYI. But I think it's all part of the same ecosystem. you know. So thank you so much, everyone. And uh, yeah, I hope to connect with you all soon. And yeah, connect with us at Trend Atelier on Instagram or LinkedIn. Keep in touch. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.